Hello, and welcome everyone to this podcast for genetics. In this podcast, we're going to talk about sex determination. As we begin this discussion, I think it's important to spend just a little bit of time talking about the difference between sex and gender. Sometimes we may confuse these terms and use them interchangeably, but we really shouldn't. When we think about genetics and the genetics of sex determination, we're really talking about sex and not gender. So when we talk about the term sex in genetics, we talk about it as mostly a binary term, meaning that individuals are typically either female or male. And the difference between female and male, as we'll talk about in this podcast, at the genetic level will help determine whether male or female genitalia form. That is, the difference, this binary difference, is based on, largely anyhow, anatomy and physiology. Gender, however, is something that's different. We don't think of it as being binary. So it's not always a binary term. Gender is often a little bit more hard to define, but we can think about gender roles. That is the role of the individual, male or female, in society. We can also think about gender as gender identity, which is an individual's concept of themselves. One's gender does not necessarily have to coincide with one's sex. In this podcast and for this class in genetics, we will talk about an individual's sex. That is, how is that individual's sex determined? Okay, so let's go ahead and get started here. So earlier in the semester, we talked about how males who are diploid produce gametes that are haploid through a process of meiosis and gamete maturation to form the mature sperm. And then we talked about how females also will take a diploid cell and through the process of meiosis will produce haploid gametes. And through a process of maturation, they will produce these oocytes. Now, even though I didn't show it here, it should be noted that typically the female gamete, the oocyte, is much larger than the male gamete, the sperm. We talked about how these two gametes can come together through the process of fertilization and make a diploid embryo, or at this stage, a zygote, which will then go on to form a mature organism. Now, what we didn't talk about yet, but we will today, is we didn't talk about what's going to determine whether this fertilized egg will be male or female. How is sex determined for this fertilized zygote? So today we're going to talk about three mechanisms of sex determination. The first that we'll talk about is the chromosome sex determination mechanism. There are going to be three types that we're going to discuss. The second is what is referred to as the genic sex determination method. And then this third is the environment sex determination method. And we'll also talk about three different ways that sex can be determined by the environment. Let's go ahead and start with our first here, chromosomal sex determination. All right, so chromosome sex determination. Okay, and as we mentioned on the previous whiteboard, there are going to be three examples using chromosomes as sex determination. The first is the XXXY system. We'll spend the most time on that system, but then we'll, we'll also spend some time on the XXXO system, and then we'll spend some time on the ZZZW system. Okay, let's begin with our XXXY sex determination system. Some examples include some plants, insects, and reptiles, but we see it in all mammals. And even in some extreme cases, the duckbill platypus, which is a mammal, produces five pairs of X chromosomes and five pairs of XY chromosomes. But the duckbill platypus always seems to do things a little differently. Okay, I want to introduce two terms to you. The first is homogametic and heterogametic. In the XXXY system, XX is the homogametic combination and XY is the heterogametic 
combination. XX individuals are usually female, and XY, the heterogametic individuals, are usually male. So to understand how different organisms can use the XXXY system differently, let's compare humans with fruit flies. Let's work with humans first, and let's write some sex chromosome combinations here. So in humans, actually I could have said mammals because this would be true with other mammals as, as well. So an XX individual is female, and an XY individual is male, as we've already mentioned up here. The XO individual, as we've learned before, that's Turner syndrome, and this individual is female. The XXY individual is male, the XXX individual is female, and the XYY individual is male. As you might guess here, what's common amongst all the males is the presence of a Y chromosome. And what's common amongst all the females is an absence of a Y chromosome. Now fruit flies, they will follow a similar pattern. XX fruit flies will be female. And I'm gonna put the female indicator over here, and you'll see why in a moment. And XY fruit fly is also male, just like in humans. So, so far, no differences. Now, it becomes more interesting when we look at an XO and an XXY fruit fly. The Turner syndrome and Kleinfelder syndrome comparables in fruit flies. The XO fruit fly turns out to be male. And the XXY fruit fly turns out to be female. Let's also look at the XX fruit fly and the XYY fruit fly. The XXX fruit fly, something that we call meta female. The XYY fruit fly is a male. So that's similar to what we see with humans. Now I'm going to add a column here to help explain why we see these differences. And here I'm going to put ploidy. So all of these are 2N. They're diploids. Sex determination in fruit flies is determined by taking the number of X chromosomes and dividing it by the ploidy to help determine what sex the fruit fly will be. So 2 divided by 2 is 1. 1 divided by 2 is 0 0.5. So let's make a table up here. When this ratio is 1, that equals a female. When the ratio is 0 0.5, that equals a male. All right, so 1 X chromosome divided by 2 for the ploidy, that gives you 0 0.5. So it's not determined by the lack of a Y chromosome. Rather, the ratio of X chromosomes to the ploidy. That's why it's male. Now, here we have two X chromosomes divided by two here, and so that's one. And that's why we have a female. Three divided by two equals 1.5. Now that's neither one or 0.5, and that's why we come up with this new term, meta-female. So greater than one equals meta-female. One X chromosome divided by two, that's one, and so that's why we have a male here. Now, let's add a few things here. Let's look at our XX individual again, and our XO individual, and our XXX individual. But instead of diploid, these three fruit flies are going to be triploids, three copies of every autosome. So two divided by three is 0 0.667. That's neither a one or a 0 0.5, it's somewhere between here. And so that is something we call an intersex. So intersex forms when this ratio is between 0 0.5 and 1. Intersex flies have both male and female tissue in them, um, but they tend to be very unhealthy and are very rare. And they're also sterile. Metafemales, I forgot to mention, but I, I should mention, is phenotypically they appear female, but they too are also fairly unhealthy and sterile. Okay, so XO in the triploid, so that's 1 divided by 3, that's 0 0.33, and this forms what we call a meta male, kind of the counter to the meta female. It has male phenotypes, but it is also not very healthy and sterile. And so we get a meta male when this ratio is, is less than 0.5. Okay, let's look at the XXX individual. Oh, actually, let's look at the 4X individual, XXXX still a triploid. Now, so four divided by three is equal to 1.3. And this is also meta-female. It doesn't have to be 1.5 to be meta-female. It just has to be greater than one. So let's spend a little bit of time trying to figure out why this is the case. Why do we see a difference between humans or mammals and fruit flies? 
They both use an X and a Y chromosome, but they use it differently. So remember, we've talked about the X chromosome before and the Y chromosome before. The Y chromosome, as we've mentioned before, has very few genes on it. It has oh, approximately 200 genes, so less than 2% of the whole genome. Many of these genes on here are linked to male sex determination. One particular gene that you should know is a gene called SRY. SRY is a transcription factor. This transcription factor will turn on a series of genes that forms the testes and blocks uterine tube development. So it forms testes to help start the formation of a male and in doing so it will start the testes will start producing testosterone. So in humans having this Y chromosome that contains the SRY gene which is necessary to help determine if the sex of the individual will be male. Not having the Y chromosome means no SRY. Therefore, the presence of the Y chromosome is necessary to determine maleness. Fruit flies are a little different. They also have an X and a Y chromosome, and the Y chromosome in fruit flies has very few genes on it as well. And a little bit about fruit flies is that they have a total of eight chromosomes, three pairs of autosomes, and one pair sex chromosomes. Turns out in fruit flies, there is no SRY gene on the Y chromosome and there are no sex determining genes at all on the Y chromosome. However, what they have been able to determine is that the X chromosome has female determining genes and that the autosomes, these three pairs here, so the autosomes have male determining genes. And that is why it is the ratio of the X chromosomes to the autosomes that helps determine maleness or femaleness. Okay, let's now move on to the XXXO sex determination system. A good example of this are the grasshoppers. In grasshoppers, XX individuals are female, just as we've seen before, so they are still the homogametic sex. Males, however, are what we call XO. So they are still what we would call the heterogametic sex. This O here doesn't stand for a particular chromosome. It stands for nothing. There is only one sex chromosome in the XXXO system, and that is the X chromosome. Having two X chromosomes allow the formation of a female. Having only one of the sex chromosomes, the X sex chromosome, allows for a male. There is no other sex chromosome. We just say XO as just a placeholder. So males are XO, and they will make gametes that either contain an X sex chromosome or a gamete that has no sex chromosome. So we'll just put an O there. Females, who are XX, will produce only gametes that have the X chromosome. When an X and an X gamete come together in this system, you end up with an embryo that is XX, or female. When the O and the X come together, you end up with a gamete that is XO, or male. So maleness in this system is not determined by the presence of a Y chromosome, but maleness is determined by only having one X chromosome. And femaleness is determined by the presence of two X chromosomes. That is all I'm going to say about this system. Let's move on to our last example of chromosomes um, determining sex. And this final example is the ZZZW system. These chromosomes don't look like Z's or W's, just like in the XY system, the chromosomes don't look like an X or Y. This system of using Z's and W's is designed so we don't confuse it with the XY system. So some examples, birds and some reptiles are the best examples. We will also see this in some amphibians and butterflies and some fish, but we'll talk mainly about birds and reptiles. This system is very similar to the XXXY system. The difference is that with the ZZZW system, the ZZ individual, that is the homogametic, is male. Remember in the XY system, the homogametic individual was female. But in ZZ, it's male. The ZW, which is the heterogametic, is female. In general, that's all you need to know about this system. Some examples, the homogametic is male, the heterogametic is female. However, one thing I want to warn you about is as you're solving some problems, make sure you know if it's a ZZZW system or an XXXY system, because the results will be reversed based upon the fact that males are homogametic in this system and females are heterogametic in this system. That wraps up what we want to say about chromosome sex determination. Next, I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about genic sex determination. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the genic sex determination system. 
but I want you to understand some differences between this and the chromosome sex determination system. And let's begin with some examples. The one I want you to definitely know are many fungi use this kind of a system. We also see it with protozoans, plants, and some fish. I should, should have said some plants and some fish. So what is the difference between the genetic system of sex determination and the chromosome system? Well, the, the big difference is that with the genetic system, there are no sex chromosomes. All sexes have the same chromosomes. So like in humans, males typically have an X and a Y chromosome, and females typically have an X and an X chromosome. There is a difference between males and females at the chromosome level. This system that fungi use, you can look at one sex and compare it to the other sex of the fungi, and their chromosomes will be indistinguishable. So what allows a fungi, say, to be either mat A or mat alpha, which are two common ways to distinguish the two different sexes in fungi. What determines which sex the fungi will be is based on genes. Now this might be a little confusing because the, because the chromosome sex determination system is also based on genes. But the difference is that there are no sex chromosomes in this system. That is, all the chromosomes look the same between one sex and the other sex. That is all I really want to say about the genetic sex determination system. I now want to move on to the environmental sex determination system. So environmental sex determination. This is probably the most interesting of the three types of sex determination. And so to talk about this, I want to talk about three examples. The first example, I'm going to focus on marine mollusks. In particular, one that is commonly referred to as slipper limpets. All right, so how are marine mollusks here, the slipper limpets, an example of environmental sex determination. They are also going to be an example of something we call sequential hermaphroditism. So in green here in my drawing, these are going to be our larvae. Red will be the females and orange will be males. So what happens first is that a larvae will settle on the bottom here and it will attach to some substrate like so. And as it attaches here, it will become female. This female now will release various chemicals. As it does so, these chemicals will attract other larvae. And as these larvae attach here to the female, they will become male. Conveniently enough, the males and females are now attached to each other, so now they mate, and they will produce offspring. Over time, this male will become a female. This female will release her own set of chemicals which will now attract a new set of larvae. It might not just be one, it might be multiple that come along here. And as that larvae attaches, it attaches and will shortly afterwards become a male. The same thing happens. This male at some point will become a female and as a female, secrete chemicals, bring a new larvae and so on. It will keep doing this time after time. And that's why we call it sequential hermaphroditism. Starts off female, attracts a male, the male then turns into female. The female then attracts a male, that male becomes a female. So it's sequential. Let's move on to our next example. In this next example, we'll focus on the temperature. This is a common method of sex determination in turtles, crocodiles, and alligators. And some other reptiles as well. In this example, I'm going to talk about turtles. So let's draw three turtle eggs. And each of these three eggs we're going to expose to a certain temperature. I don't really want you to focus on or memorize sp specific temperatures. I want you to recognize that temperature can affect sex determination. So instead of putting a temperature, I'm just going to put an optimal temperature. So at this optimal temperature, you'll see roughly a one-to-one -one ratio of males to females. Now if you warm this temperature, so a warm temperature, and I should point out that the difference in temperature usually isn't great. Usually it's only a couple degrees, two, three, maybe four degrees difference. But in turtles, that's enough to make more females. If you have a cooler temperature, decrease the temperature, you will have more males. Turns out that alligators are the reverse. My main take home point I want you to have with this is that a temperature change for reptiles can change the proportion of males to females or females to males. I also want you to note that these 
reptiles will often use the Z Z, Z, W system or the X, 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 Y system. That's what helps determine the sex in these optimal temperatures. But a change in temperature can override this system. The evolutionary advantages of it is not known. But it's an interesting thing to think about that in these reptiles, they have a standard system to determine sex, but the temperature can shift it. Okay, now I want to move on to the last example for environmental sex determination. And this system is called behavior or social structure determination. Unfortunately, if you're a fan of Finding Nemo, you will probably never be able to watch that movie again the same. And if you're like me, you will attempt to ruin this movie for everybody else with some basic scientific facts. But it's okay. It's just a movie. Okay, so let's remind you a little bit about the story of Nemo. Now, if you haven't watched Nemo, Finding Nemo, there's a bit of a spoiler alert here. So I apologize. But if you have watched it, or heard of it, you probably know of this story, where you have Nemo's father here, I believe his name is Marlin, and his mother here, I forget what her name is, but she's not in the story very long, and then you see the two of them over here, looking over their brood of soon-to-be baby clownfish. And, as one might predict, this barracuda comes along here, wanting to eat the clownfish and all the babies, and the mom, in the process, dies, leaving the dad, Marlin, here to have many adventures with Nemo. And we'll come back to this in a moment to explain some of the errors that we see in this in this um, fine Disney classic. Okay, so let's draw what it might look inside of a bunch of sea anemones here. And what you're going to see in here is one and only one large reproductive female. And what you'll also see in here is another clownfish that is smaller. And we're going to call this one a small reproductive male. Now, also in here, there's going to be several other, much smaller clownfish, which we'll just draw like so, just kind of waiting in the, the wings, so to speak. And we call these non-reproductive juveniles. The only way one of these non-reproductive juveniles can become a male is to start to produce testosterone. However, they won't do this until this male is gone. The only way to get rid of this one here is if it dies, perhaps, or if it gets promoted here to a female, the large reproductive female. And the way it's going to do that is by producing more estrogen. However, this doesn't happen easily. It won't leave typically until it dies. So how is it possible that we can go from these non-reproductive juveniles to reproductive males to this large reproductive female? Well, the only way this is possible is if these non-reproductive juveniles and these small reproductive males have both male and female reproductive tissues. The testosterone allows the male reproductive tissues to develop into this small reproductive male. The small reproductive male still has female reproductive tissues. So with the, the decrease in testosterone and the increase in estrogen, it will have the male gonads, the testes, dissolve away and the female reproductive tissues will emerge, allowing it to now become the large reproductive female. So now the question that we want to consider is this. Why is it possible that we only have one large reproductive female? And what we now know is that this large reproductive female is very aggressive. Its aggressive behavior towards this small reproductive male and these non-reproductive -repro juveniles will suppress the formation of testosterone in these non-reproductive juveniles and the suppression of estrogen in this small reproductive male. So due to her behavior, she's able to sort of rule this whole area where they live in the sea anemone so that these other fish cannot take her spot. She rules by her aggressive behavior. Once she dies due to age or a barracuda coming along here and eating her up, now that aggressive behavior is gone. And so now this reproductive male can now begin to produce estrogen and it will now become the large reproductive female. One of these, whichever one it is, maybe it's this lucky guy here, he will now start producing more testosterone and will now be promoted to this small reproductive male. However, it's going to stop here because now who used to be the male is now the large reproductive female and now she will be the aggressive uh, large reproductive female and rule this sea anemone. So how did Finding Nemo get it wrong? Well, in a few different ways. First of all, Marlin here, the dad, would not be larger than the mom. The reproductive female will always be larger. So they missed it there, but that's okay. The other part that they they got wrong was that once mom was eaten by the barracuda here, Marlin here, the reproductive male, 
would now, instead of hanging out with his son, cruising the ocean, having all these adventures, would now assume the position of the large reproductive female. And then maybe Nemo or one of his other non-reproductive juveniles here would now assume the position of the small reproductive male. But that's okay. It's a Disney movie. We can give him some breaks. All right, well, that ends what we have to say about sex determination. The last thing I want to talk about is this thing called dosage compensation. It's not directly linked to sex determination, but it's an important consideration, particularly in the systems that involve sex chromosomes. Remember, when we talked about X inactivation earlier, we said the purpose of that was so that every cell would produce the same amount of proteins from the X chromosome. So if you remember, in humans, we said there are XX individuals and XY individuals, yet they all produce the same amount of X chromosome proteins. One might assume that since there are two X chromosomes in females, that they would produce more X chromosome encoded proteins than males. But that's not what we see. We see about the same. What I didn't tell you was that other animals use different systems to achieve the same result. So let's remind you about placental mammals as one of them. And let's, let me tell you about how C. elegans accomplish this dosage comp compensation. And finally, let me tell you how Drosophila melanogaster accomplishes dosage compensation. Placental mammals, remember, is the example that we just I was just talking about. But what they do here is they inactivate one X chromosome if more than one exists. So in males, XY males, they would not inactivate their own X chromosome. But if there are two X chromosomes, they will inactivate one of those. And remember, we talked about that when you have two X chromosomes here, randomly, one of these gets inactivated and becomes a bar body. The purpose of this, again, is so that males and females will always produce the same amount of proteins from that one X chromosome. C. elegans, they don't inactivate any of their X chromosomes. What they do, though, is they express the X chromosome at half the rate when two X chromosomes are present. So if this is a cell from a female, each of their X chromosomes are expressed at half the rate as compared to the male who only have one X chromosome. They will express their genes at the full rate, thereby allowing males and females to produce equivalent amounts of proteins from their X chromosomes. Now Drosophila melanogaster, they do something a little different, but they accomplish the same goal. In the XY male, they will express X chromosome genes at twice the rate. I don't have room right here to show this, but let's just go up here to this corner. In females that have two X chromosomes, they will express their X chromosomes at a usual rate. But in males with only one X chromosome, they will express these genes at twice the rate. Again, all three of these mechanisms, their goal is that males and females produce equ equivalent amount of X chromosome encoded proteins. Okay, that is all I have for this podcast. If you have any questions at all, please make sure you come see me. If not, I will see you in class.